Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 1. 1917. Chapter 8. The Abyss. October-December, 1917. The Abyss has opened at last. Bolshevism has conquered, it was all very simple. The Provisional Government and the First All-Russian Soviet were overthrown as easily as was the Tsarist regime. Through their military committees of revolution the Bolsheviki got control of the regiments. Through the Petrograd Workers Soviet they became masters of the working classes. These soldiers and Petrograd workmen commandeered all automobiles in the street, occupied the Winter Palace, Petropavlovskaya Fortress, the railway stations, the telephones, and the posts. To destroy the old government and to establish the new, required only a bare 24 hours. On October 25th, in spite of illness, I set out for the Winter Palace to get news. In the streets I saw the familiar spectacle of speeding automobiles full of sailors and Latvian soldiers, firing recklessly as they passed, no trams, no droshkis. But so accustomed had all of us grown to this condition of things that I went on quite indifferently. Approaching the Winter Palace, I found it surrounded by Bolshevist troops. It would have been sheer folly to walk into their arms, so I turned around and sought, in the Mariinsky Palace, the Council of the Republic. There I learned that while Kerensky had fled to the front to seek military assistance, Konovalov and other ministers, with the governor of Petrograd, Ruttenberg and Palchinsky, were barricaded in the Winter Palace defended only by a regiment of women soldiers and 300 military cadets. This is outrageous. Stormed a social democratic deputy. We shall certainly protest against such violence. What? Are we going to pass another resolution? I asked. In the name of the Soviet, the Council of the Republic and the government we shall appeal to the country and to the world democracy. He replied, offended at my levity. And what is that but another resolution? I asked banteringly. We shall appeal to the military forces. What military forces? Officers and Cossacks are still faithful. The same men whom the revolutionary democracy treated as counter-revolutionaries and reactionaries, I persisted. Have you forgotten how you insulted them, especially after Kornilov's failure? After that do you imagine that they will be willing to defend us? I think, on the contrary, that they will be rather gratified at what has happened. The Council of the Republic convened, and a proposal to protest against the criminal attack on the rights of the people and of the government was made and debated. But the discussion did not last very long, for suddenly the hall was invaded by a troop of soldiers who announced. According to a decree of the new government the Council of the Republic is dispersed. Leave here immediately or submit to arrest. The chairman of the council said. The resolution of protest has been heard. All in favor raise their hands. The resolution was carried. Then the chairman said. Under pressure of violence the Council of the Republic is temporarily interrupted. Such was the end of the First Republic, an end scarcely more heroic than that of the Duma. With great difficulty I forced my way through the crowd to the Committee of the Peasant Soviet. Here also was great excitement. A minority of the Soviet, under the leadership of Spiridonova, Nat Hansen, Steinberg, Katz, and Schreider, were already preparing to join the Bolsheviki. The majority of the Soviet seemed rather helpless, but I perceived some signs of activity, for in one room the deputies were being furnished with revolvers and hand grenades. This at least was better than mere verbosity. Comrade Sorokin, have you a revolver? The commander of our military section asked me, and on my affirmative reply he said. Take another. You may need it. It was decided that our members should meet that evening with the all-Russian Soviet, and as it seemed certain that the Bolsheviki, with the help of the Petrograd Soviet, would try to force the majority of the members of the all-Russian Soviet to join them, we agreed on the Municipal Duma, center of anti-Bolshevik activities, for rendezvous of this majority. Lying ill all day on my bed, I listened to the steady booming of the cannon and the spatter of machine guns and crack of rifles. 
Over the telephone I learned that the Bolsheviki had brought up from Kronstadt the warship Aurora and had opened fire on the Winter Palace demanding the surrender of members of the provisional government, still barricaded there. At seven in the evening I went to the Municipal Duma. With many matters before us, the immediate horror that faced us was this situation at the Winter Palace. There a regiment of women and the military cadets were bravely resisting an overwhelming force of Bolshevist troops, and over the telephone Minister Konovalov was appealing for aid. Poor women, poor lads, their situation was desperate, for we knew that the wild sailors, after taking the palace, would probably tear them to pieces. What could we do? After breathless counsel it was decided that all of us, the Soviets, municipalities, committees of socialist parties, members of the Council of the Republic, should go in procession to the Winter Palace and do our utmost to rescue the ministers, the women soldiers, and the cadets. Even as we prepared to go, over the telephone came the despairing shout. The gates of the palace have been forced. The massacre has begun, hurry. The mob has reached the first floor. All is over. Goodbye, they break in. They are. That last word of Konovalov from the Winter Palace was a broken cry. Rushing out, we formed in some kind of an orderly line and in the darkness of the unlighted street we started, a few dim lanterns showing us our way. Never had Petrograd seen such a hopeless march. In absolute silence like phantoms we moved forward. Near Kazansky Cathedral three loaded automobiles full of sailors, machine guns, and bombs stopped us. Halt! Who goes there? Representatives of the municipality, the Soviets, the Council of the Republic, and the Socialistic Parties. Where are you going? To the Winter Palace, to end this civil war and to save the defenders of the palace. Nobody can approach the palace. Turn back at once or we fire on you. Nothing to do, we returned in ghastly silence to the Municipal Duma. There we made one more effort to communicate with the palace, but the wires had by this time been cut. The firing had ceased and we knew that the massacre was probably in full swing. Along pitch-dark streets I staggered to my home where I found my wife half-dead with anxiety for me. Rudd I calmed her. My dear wife, we must now be prepared for whatever comes. The worst, in all human probability. Next day I went out to meet my unhappy associates. The aspect of things was horrible. At the corner of Zemensky and Bassini streets I came on a crowd of soldiers plundering a wine shop. Already brutally drunk, they yelled. Long life to the Bolsheviki and death to capitalistic government. In other places similar scenes. Huge crowds of soldiers, sailors, and workmen plundered the cellars of the Winter Palace. Broken bottles littered the square, cries, shrieks, groans, obscenities, filled the clean morning. Many of those who entered the cellars could not get out owing to the press of those who madly pushed forward to get in. The cellars swam in wine from broken casks and bottles and many men were actually drowned in the flood of it. The besieged ministers had not been murdered but had been rushed off to Petropavlovskaya fortress to join the ministers of the Tsar. But the fate of the women was even worse than our imaginations had been able to picture. Many had been killed, and those who escaped merciful death had been savagely ravished by the Bolsheviki. Some of these women soldiers were so vilely abused that they died in frightful agony. Some of the officials of the provisional government were also murdered with sadistic cruelty. O oh liberty, what crimes, what unspeakable crimes! In thy name! The news from Kerensky was indefinite. The central committees of the Social Revolutionary and the Social Democratic parties met, and some effort was made towards organizing a force of cadets from the military schools. In the office of my newspaper I wrote my first article on the conquerors, hailing them as murderers, ravishers, brigands, and robbers. I signed this article with my full name, in spite of the protests of my colleagues and even the compositors. Let it stand, I said. We all face death anyhow. As a matter of fact my article had such a success that we had to print three times the usual number of papers. But while my friends lauded it, the mobs in the streets and even in private houses grew larger and more lawless. Murders, assaults, looting, 
especially of wine shops, increased. Passion for drink grew so great that the crowd risked even death to effect the immediate nationalization of the dram shops. In desperation citizens prepared to defend their homes. In the evening an armed band broke into our newspaper office to arrest all the editors. Fortunately, there was present only Lebedev, formerly minister of the navy in Kerensky's cabinet, and he managed to escape through a back door. My friends begged me not to spend the night at my home, and I decided to follow their advice. I consented also to change my appearance by ceasing to shave. Many are doing the same, clean-shaven men appearing with beards, bearded men shaving. Next day brought no news of Kerensky, but we heard of a fight near Gachino, and of the massacre of all the cadets in Petrograd military schools. These young heroes fought like lions and died at last like true patriots. Everything is closed, schools, shops, banks, offices. Hunger is everywhere increasing. Kerensky is defeated. The Bolsheviki have taken the banks, state and private, and my former friend Pyatikov has been made commissary of finance. From the front come new tales of horror. Generalissimo Dukhanin has been murdered with hundreds of other officers. Our army is now a wild flying mob which destroys everything that stands in its path, German invasion is inevitable. Clerks and officials of governmental and private institutions have organized a strike as a protest against Bolshevist excesses. Their sabotage handicaps the new rulers, who have begun a merciless persecution of the people. Many are imprisoned. In spite of all this, the strikers hold firmly. Today I spoke at their meeting and just as I closed the chairman cried. They have come for you. Run through this door. I reached the street and was quickly borne away in an automobile kept for emergencies by these simple heroes. The play of cat and mouse has begun. Well, let us be a mouse. We shall be caught, but until that happens we shall do what conscience and duty still dictate. Today my colleague Arganov, one of the founders of the Social Revolutionary Party, fell into the claws of the cat. Management and publication of newspapers will now be carried on under difficulties. Invasion of editorial offices and printing plants have become an everyday routine. Bolshevik soldiers destroy copy and even presses. As a matter of form, we obey orders to cease our publications, but they reappear immediately under slightly altered names. The will of the people suppressed yesterday appears today as the will, and later on as the people, the wish of the people, and so on. The newspaper the day appears as morning, midday, afternoon, evening, night, black midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock. What is important is that our newspapers are finally published. The readers who fail to get one in the morning read one at night. Today again I narrowly escaped arrest. As I entered the courtyard of our building a band of persecutors followed me, some going to the office, others remaining at the gate. Fortunately, they did not know me by sight, and as it was dark I lingered outside devising plans of escape. One of our printers emerging from the doorway, I called him and explained my plight. Just a moment. He said, and in a few minutes he came back with a certificate identifying me as one of the working force. All right now. Let us go out together as though for supper. At the gate we were stopped and our certificates demanded. We showed them and the guard said gruffly. Pass on. So again the mouse escaped. It is an interesting fact that this persecution is conducted by the very men who a few days ago were loudest in clamoring for a free press. Our daily menu at home becomes exotic. There is no bread, but yesterday we found at a small shop a few tins of preserved peaches. For bread we prepare cake from potato skins and find it not too awful to swallow. Long life to the revolution which stimulates invention and makes the people more modest in their appetites and desires. Elections to the Constitutional Assembly are being held all over Russia. These elections are a challenge of the country to the Bolshevist revolution. If the Bolsheviki are right, they will get a majority of votes. Very soon we shall have the verdict of Russia. Of course, the Bolsheviki do everything in their power to block the elections, and all the hunted mice are doing their best to facilitate them. 
During the past week I have spoken at 12 meetings. The working people are in the first stage of sobering off. The Bolshevist paradise is beginning to fade, and hostility to social patriots is disappearing. Three times the workers have saved me from arrest. At a meeting at the Trubokny factory a group of armed men came in and interrupted my speech, shouting. At last we have caught you. You are arrested. I shouted back, I am arrested if these workmen consent. Take your hands off comrade Sorokin. Roared the audience. While one crowd held back the soldiers another surrounded and hurried me to a safe refuge. The first results of the elections have been published and the Bolsheviki are beaten. They, together with the left social revolutionary revolutionaries are far behind the right wing of the party, and both are in a minority in the Constitutional Assembly. My name and those of other comrades in Vologda province gained about 90% of all votes. Last night we celebrated in a most extravagant banquet, each of us having a bit of bread, half a sausage, preserved peaches, and tea with sugar. The Bolsheviki are decisively beaten, but our situation becomes more serious, our responsibilities incomparably heavier. Had the Bolsheviki received a majority we should have submitted, but the votes of the people declare them an illegal government. Yet we know that the Bolsheviki have no intention of accepting the verdict. As long as they hoped for a favorable vote they were willing for the Constitutional Assembly to meet. Now they will try to prevent its meeting. We must meet force with force. There is no other way. The Committee for the Defense of the Constitutional Assembly has been formed. In the sphere of propaganda it does well, but in the assembling of military forces not so well. We have some troops, but obviously not so many as the Bolsheviki. Every day I speak, attend sittings of the leaders who are elaborating laws, decrees, and policies of the Constituent Assembly. In between I play the role of mouse against cat. Legally all deputies are immune from arrest, but the law is one thing, Bolshevist practice another. All roads now lead to prison. I am tired, exhausted, partly with work and excitement, partly with hunger. But I repeat the words of the poet. Wait a little and you will have your rest. In prison or in the grave. As an opening attack on the Constituent Assembly the Bolsheviki ordered all deputies to go to Uritsky, an especially appointed commissary, to register their names and addresses and to offer documentary proofs of their election to the Assembly, the opening of which has been postponed from November 27 to January 5, 1918. We declared this order illegal. The deputies of the people cannot be prevented from assembling by Uritsky, the verification of their claims being a matter for a special committee of deputies in which the Bolsheviki are fully represented. We object also to the arbitrary postponement of the agreed informal meeting of deputies on November 27. November 27. The legal opening day of the Constituent Assembly dawned beautifully clear. Blue sky, white snow, an auspicious background for the huge placards everywhere displayed. Long life to the Constitutional Assembly, the master of Russia. Crowds of people, bearing these standards, welcome the highest authority of the country, the real voice of the Russian people. As the deputies approached the Tavrichesky Palace, thousands of people hailed them with deafening cheers. But when the deputies reached the gates they found them closed and guarded by Bolshevist Lettish soldiers, armed to the teeth. Something had to be done, and at once. Climbing the iron fence of the palace I addressed the people while other deputies climbed and scrambled after me. They managed to unlock the gates and the crowds rushed in filling the courtyard. Staggered at the audacity of this move, the Lettish soldiers hesitated. We attacked the doors of the palace, also guarded by Lettish soldiers and officers behind whom appeared Uritsky and other Bolsheviki again speaking to the people, I concluded by thanking the Lettish soldiers for their welcome to the highest authority in Russia and their apparent willingness to guard its liberties. At last I even embraced the commanding officer. The whole lot wavered in confusion and as a result the doors were opened and we walked in, many of the citizens following. In the passage, Uritsky, an exceedingly repulsive Jew, demanded that we go to his office to register, but contemptuously we pushed him aside saying that the Constitutional Assembly stood in no need of his services. 
In the hall of the palace we held our meeting and called upon the Russian nation to defend its constitutional assembly. A resolution was passed that the assembly, in spite of every obstacle, should open on January 5th. To ensure its successful meeting, we hold daily meetings in the factories and among the soldiers. At the same time the leaders continue their work of preparing fundamental laws and decrees, methods of procedure, etc. These conferences are usually held in my apartment. In the face of the great crisis ahead we have at last buried all differences of opinion and work in absolute accord. Yet there are occasional signs of the old fatal weakness. Today at a meeting of representatives of the Petrograd garrison, the subject under discussion was the relation of soldiers to the Constitutional Assembly. Speakers of all parties were present. The garrison was inclined to assume a passive attitude, not inimical of course, but not aggressively defensive. Exasperated by this cursed pacifism, I burst out, begging the soldiers to remember how many generations of Russian people had dreamed of the Constitutional Assembly as the greatest blessing that could ever happen. Thousands of men and women, I told them, have sacrificed their lives for the realization of this dream. Now when the great dream is about to come true, when the Constitutional Assembly is about to open, you dally with the idea of a Bolshevist paradise, you refuse to do your duty. Traitors to your country. If you cling to this mad delusion you will reap its certain fruits. Within a few months you will face starvation, tyranny, civil war, and horrors which you cannot even imagine. Remember then what voices warned you of what this treachery would certainly bring. That is all I have to say. Two regiments promised to be active in defending the assembly. Of the others I have no hope. The hand of the destroyer lies heavily on Petrograd. All commercial life is stopped. Shops are closed. In the factories discipline and authority have disappeared, the workers spending their time in vacuous conversation and oratory. Mounds of dirty snow block the streets. Night and day we hear the sounds of guns. Madness, plundering, and pillage lay waste the towns and even the country. There exists no longer any army and the Germans can walk in whenever they choose. This is the last day of 1917. I look back on the year with feelings of bitterness and disillusionment. The year 1917 gave us the revolution, but what has revolution brought to my country but ruin and disgrace? Has it brought us freedom? Has it bettered the condition of the people? No, the face of revolution unveiled is the face of a beast, of a vicious and wicked prostitute, not that of the pure goddess which has been painted by historians of other revolutions. I could pray that these historians themselves might live through a real revolution. At New Year's we meet together, the social revolutionary leaders and deputies. Dull sorrow mingled with grim resolution to die fighting for liberty mark all our speeches. This mournful enthusiasm reached its climax after the speech of my friend K, when we listened to the singing of the famous aria from Mussorgsky's opera, Kovanshina, The Strelet Sleeps. My poor Russia sleeps, she is encompassed by enemies. Aliens are robbing her. Long years before it lay under the yoke of the Tatars, it groaned under the yoke of the aristocrats. My poor Russia. Who now will save you from your foes? Who will save you from your misfortunes? Oh loved and unhappy Russia! The words moved us profoundly. We do not know who will save our Russia. But whatever sorrows lie before you now, dear country, you shall not perish. From these ashes you will rise, a great country and a great nation, a power among the powers of the earth. If for this it is necessary for us to lay down our lives, we are ready. May our fatherland be forever blessed. Such were the words of the eloquent K which closed our New Year's celebration. The prospects for 1918 are very dark, but come what may I believe in my country and its historical mission. Sooner or later we shall find the way out. Be blessed every day and every night my beloved country.